They have numbered 217 saints. 217, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend his cause. Men team the honor of his word, the glory of his cross. 217, and that's really he to sing out.
apart from the fetus, of course. <laughs> That's why he's concentrating on me. <laughs> so I'm very glad to be here, and I trust that the bright light will not in any way deter me from preaching the message that Paul has given me. Now I'm going to read to you from the 121st Psalm. I'm very fond of the Psalms. I have uh, learned these Psalms when I was a boy. That must be 20 years ago now. And uh, they're very dear to me. I live much in the Psalms. So we're going to read this very familiar one, the 121st. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh mine help. My help cometh from the Lord. Isn't that good, Christian? My help cometh from the Lord. That's where you get your true help. My help cometh from the Lord, which has made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. I what a God we have. <laughs> He preserves us from all evil. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. And God will write this wonderful word upon our hearts. Let us pray. <coughs> o God, we thank thee for the privilege of coming into thy house tonight and having fellowship with the people of God and above all to know that thou art with us. Thou hast promised that where two or three are met together in thy name, there am I in the midst. O God, manifest thy power in our meeting. Grant, Lord, that we might hear what God the Lord would say to us. Hide the speaker. And grant, Lord, that we may hear none but Jesus only. And grant, too, Lord, that his great name might be glorified and magnified through our coming together. And that some dear soul might truly find the Savior. Encourage thine own children in these days of battle and apostasy. Encourage them, Lord, in thy service. Bless, Lord, throughout our problems tonight. Bless in our sister churches especially. Anoint every preacher who stands behind the sacred desk and grant that this might be a great night in Zion. We ask it in the worthy name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> now, it would be very difficult for me to give you all my experiences over the last uh, 70 odd years. Oh, I know I don't look over 70, but uh, nevertheless, you'll notice that I have a center shade now that I haven't in my earlier days. Now, my childhood was a very simple life. I was brought up in a Presbyterian home in the country, out in Dundonald, in the county Down. That's where all the good people come from, of course. I had to go to Sabbath school when I was a boy, and as I mentioned, I had to learn the Psalms and the child's catechism and the shorter catechism. So I knew quite a lot uh, of the Bible. I learned many portions of God's Word, like Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed, and so on, and Isaiah 55. Who every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And then I learned all these great old Psalms, the first Psalm. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And of course the great old 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And the 27th Psalm, the Lord is my light and my salvation. 
And then the 34th, I will bless the Lord at all times. And right on through the Psalms, and I knew, and I still love them. I had to keep the Sabbath. You see, the Westminster Confession of Faith teaches that the Sabbath is to be sanctified by a holy resting all that day. Even from such worldly employments and recreations which are lawful on other days, and spending the whole time in public and private exercise of God's worship, except so much which is taken up by the works of necessity and mercy. So as good Presbyterians, we had to keep the Sabbath. I hope you do that. You know, there's an awful lot going under that heading, uh, the works of necessity and mercy. I heard of a couple of old Covenanters who were coming home from their meeting house. They were both farmers, James and John. And they were passing John's field, and there was a very nice heifer in it. And of course, James said to John, that's a great heifer you have, but if it wasn't the Sabbath day, I would give you a bid for it. So of course, John said to James, well, if it wasn't the Sabbath day, how much would you give me for it? <laughs> and uh, they had it sold, of course. Yes. It's incumbent upon us who are saved to keep the Sabbath day. Now my parents, my mother was a Christian, my father wasn't, he didn't make any profession, but he was a great church goer, he was uh, a great uh, naval officer, and we had to toe the line, and when he said go to Sabbath school there was no saying no. Uh, I remember on one occasion, he used to get us to weed the garden when we were boys, this time of the year, or a bit later on. He would give us so many rigs of potatoes to weed, or maybe the carrots and so on, and uh, then he would look at it in the evening, and uh, John had his done. In the morning he would come to my room, and he would knock the door and come in, and he would say, John, get up and do your weeding, and you'll get your breakfast when it's done. So that's the sort of the way I was brought up, very strictly, and I praise God for that. Would the God parents have the same control over their children today? And would the God children were more subject to their parents today? That's what's killing our land. But that's how I was brought up. I never was in a public house in my life. I never was in a dance hall. Of course, if you looked at my feet, you would realize I'd have been a bit of a mess in the dance hall. But I was brought up like that. I never cursed and swore. Never used bad language. It was never used in our house. There was no smoking in our house. And on Sunday we dressed on our Sunday best. We weren't allowed to play with our toys. We weren't allowed to play games. Now we have children bringing their toys to church. Things have changed, haven't they? Not for the better. So my childhood was a very simple country life. And a religious life, if you like. And I praise God for that. Some people in giving their testimony can say, you know, I was a, a vile rascal. I was in pubs. I ran after women and I lived a hectic life. Well, I thank God, God preserved me from that. And I lived a clean life, an upright life. I remember, too, whistling the Protestant boys one Sunday. I was a great whistler. I used to be a great singer. I was telling a brother here, I was a great singer at one time and used to sing uh, when I was an era younger preacher. Before I came into the free church, of course, I used to preach quite a lot in the early days. And I remember singing one night at a gospel meeting and a lady said to me, you have a very mellow voice, uh, Mr. Wiley. And I thought that was a tremendous compliment. Until I went home and looked up my dictionary. And I found that the word mellow meant overripe or half rotten. <laughs> so I, I didn't sing any more so But uh, that's how I was brought up. And uh, I was whistling the Protestant boys. And Mother said, John, do you not know what day it is? You can't whistle that on Sunday, you know. Of course, I could whistle it the other six days. And so I did with a lot of other hot airs. I uh, was brought up in a Protestant home. Now, as a boy, I was brought into contact with young fellows in my class at school who had godly parents, who were saved people. And I remember one boy, Willie Gibson, still a good friend of mine. 
And he used to tell me about being saved. Now I want to say this honestly and sincerely. That I never heard in my church, in the Presbyterian church in Dundon, I never heard the gospel preached. I never heard the minister appealing for young men and women to accept the Savior. I don't know what they preached. I can never understand it. But they didn't preach the gospel. But God was very patient with me and very gracious. And he brought me into contact with those who were saved. Young fellows. And he used to make me think. And Willie's father was a farmer and a very godly man. He was the brother of a famous old preacher, a cattle dealer called George Gibson of Cross God. Maybe some of you older people have heard of George Gibson. And this was a brother, James. And I used to go up and when James Gibson saw us boys up in the farmyard and he would say, boys, come on in. And we would go into the big flagstone floor kitchen and he would say, now boys, sit down. I'm going to read to you from God's Word. I wonder, older person, do you do that? Do you take an interest in youth? And he would make us sit there, and we sat very quietly. And those days we had respect for our elders. And he would read to us God's Word. And then he would say, now boys, I'm going to pray for you. And my brother and I... <coughs> Willie Gibson and his brothers would all kneel and James would pray. We called James by his Christian name, very affectionately, James Gibson. And he would pray. And you know when he got up on his knees, the tears would be on his cheeks as he prayed for us followers. Thank God for men like that. And God's looking for men like that. who will take an interest in the youth of our land and pray for them. And when I was a lad of nine, and I'm going away back 30 years, uh, when I was a lad of nine, I remember standing in the corner of a field beside my old home, and God spoke to me, and God said, Give me thine heart. And I stood there. I can see that today. I can see myself standing there today. I was nine years of age. And you know what I said to God? I'll come when I'm 12. If there's a nine-year-old boy or girl here, don't say that. Come now when you're nine. And I didn't come when I was nine, when I was 12. But I came later. I came when I was 19. And it came about like this. Now, I was never in any other church but a Presbyterian church. I was a very devout Presbyterian. And a, a man whom I got to know invited me to a Baptist church. <laughs> God bless the Baptists. They need it, you know. And uh, there was a man called Peach having a mission, an American. He was a mighty man. And I never heard an American preacher before, and he spoke in his broad American accent. And uh, he was preaching on a subject that I never attempted to preach on. I don't know whether Brother Gordon has preached on this subject or not, but he preached on the subject love, courtship, and marriage. Well, I have experienced them all, <laughs> but I never ventured to preach on it. He was exhorting young Christians how to live, how to conduct their lives, what partner to choose in life. And that's very important. Be very careful, young folk, about the partner that you choose in life. And as he preached, God spoke to my heart. Religious, good living, upright as I was. And convinced me that I wasn't one of the people that Mr. Peach was preaching to. And at the end of the service, he gave out an appeal. Now he says, maybe there's a young man here, and you're not saved. <laughs> and he says, while we're singing the last hymn, would you put up your hand? And I put my hand up. And it was, I was trembling. And I'm not easily made tremble. I was always able to look after myself. You know, I could land a bunch of fives on a fellow's chin if he annoyed me and all that sort of thing. But 
I, I, I was trembling that night, trembling. And then, at the end of the singing of that hymn, he said, Now, those who put their hands up, would you come right down to the front of the church and take my hand? There was a lady sitting beside me, and she got up and went out, and I went and followed her. I said, I, I, are you going to meet the, the preacher? Oh no, she said, I'm going for an early bus. <laughs> and the devil said, look, John, you go for an early bus, because you're making a fool of yourself. And I stood there in the vestibule of that church. I didn't know anybody, apart from the young man who invited me, and I don't know whether he was there or not. And I stood there in a strange church, as a stranger, and then God gave me grace. And you know God can give you grace. Repentance unto life, our catechism teaches, is a saving grace. For by a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin, and apprehension of the mercy of God and Christ, doth with grief and hatred turn from his sin unto God. And I turned and I walked right down the aisle. That was on the 4th of November, 1932. Now that's a good while ago. That's almost 53 years ago. And that dear old man took my hand. But somebody else took my hand that night. It was God himself. And he saved me. An upright, honest, clean living boy. I got saved. Because it doesn't matter what your upbringing is. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you can claim to be or do. If you're not saved, you'll go to hell. It's just as plain as that. And if John Wiley had died like that, with all his good upbringing and all his knowledge of the Bible, and all his knowledge of the catechism, and knowing the doctrines of grace, he would have gone to hell. But my God gives me grace that night to turn, and to go down and take that old preacher by the hand. And then I kneeled with him at an old form, along with the pastor of the church, and I passed from death unto life. And that's, I say, almost 53 years ago. Old W.P. Nicholson used to say, salvation is like the soles of your feet that wears well. And so it does. And after 43 years, I want to say this tonight, that God has been more than good to me. He has preserved my going out and my coming in. Just a short time after I was saved, a couple of years, my dear old dad died. Well, he wasn't so very old. He wasn't as old as I am now. Of course, I'm not old. He called me into his room one morning. He said, John, I'm done. I put my arm around his shoulder. Mother rushed down the stairs to get something for him, and he just died with my arm and around the shoulder. And I was very distressed. And I remember coming home from a meeting. That's why I read that psalm tonight. This is one of the explanations why I read it. I came home from a meeting one night, very distressed. I was left responsible at home. And I sat down in the drawing room and I opened my Bible and said, Lord, will you give me a word? And God gave me that psalm. I read through it till I came to the last verse and it says, The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. When my earthly father had left me, my heavenly father said, well, I'll never leave you. Oh, young people, I want to tell you that here's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. One who will never leave you. One who will be your guide even unto death. Will you take him tonight? As I do. When I got saved, people got to hear about it. And older Christians came to me and said, John, we have a, a prayer union meeting in Belly Bean Hall. That was a little country uh, hall outside Dundon. Come along and have fellowship with us. 
And I remember going along there and hearing these dear old saints pray. And their faces were shining. And they'd be shouting hallelujah. Praise the Lord. As maybe the scriptures were read and their hearts were thrilled. And you know that did me a word of good. That was my early theological training. And then they said to me after we went on, maybe you'd give a wee word tonight. And I would come along and give my testimony and maybe read a chapter and try to tell them something that I got out of it. And so on and on I went until God finally brought me into the ministry, which I'll tell you uh, in about another hour or two. (laughs) But after I was saved, I wasn't very long in discovering that the major denomination, the Presbyterian Church particularly, of which I was a member, the young boy, that they had completely apostatized and that they were against the gospel of Jesus Christ. I discovered that. And I remember I went back to the to the uh, Bible class on Sunday morning after I got saved. There was a Bible class in the Presbyterian Church in Dundon. The Reverend McQuitty was the minister. I'm not ashamed to mention his name or the church. I don't hide anything. Never did. And I went back to the Bible class on Sunday morning after I was saved. And one morning I asked a question. I said, excuse me, Mr. McQuitty, could I ask a question? He said, this is no place to ask a question. He didn't like to be questioned in a Bible class. A Bible class is the very place to ask questions. That's why we have Bible classes. He said, see me outside. So I saw him outside and I explained my difficulty and I wanted an answer. Oh, he said, I haven't time to talk to you now. I must be into my morning service. So he put me off again, you see. These old apostates don't like to be questioned even by a young convert. And I was very willing to listen to his explanation. The following Saturday night, he called up my parents' home. And I went to the door. I said, come on in, sir. No, no, he said, I don't want to see your parents. I just want to see you. Well, I said, what do you want to see me about? He said, I just want to tell you, don't come back to church unless you can accept all that I preach. Don't ask any questions. If you do, you can't come back to my church. So I was put out for asking a question. And these old apostates at this present day don't like to be asked questions. They're not prepared to face the bit. And so I was put out. And it's very worthy of note that at that time the whole church was being apostatized. Now, in America in 1924, in the United Presbyterian Church in the United States, they circulated what was known then as the Auburn Affirmation. And that affirmation stated that the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ are non-essentials. Friends, those are the very essentials. If Christ didn't die, if Christ didn't rise, if Christ didn't ascend to heaven, then we have no salvation. And by 1936 in America, in a matter of 12 years, 1,300 Presbyterian ministers signed that. That Christ's death and resurrection and even his miracles were non-essential. And the whole American church apostatized. <coughs> and in 1920, and right on through the early 20s, the Irish Presbyterian church did exactly the same. And Professor Davy, who was the principal of Assemblies College at that time, he taught his young students in the ministry. He said, you know, the Bible has hundreds of direct contradictions. And he said, Christ was no more human than we are. And he said, Christ had the dregs of humanity upon him. And he said, and I'm quoting verbatim now, he said, Christ made the greatest mistake of his life 
when he went to the cross. Thus, as Nicholson would have said, on bloody Unitarianism, thus denying the mighty work of Christ on the cross and denying his deity. And I wasn't very long in discovering that. And then there was a split in the Irish Presbyterian Church in 1927. A dear old man called Dr. James Hunter. He was a retired minister. And when this teaching was going on, he and a few others objected to it. And a young minister called W.J. Greer demanded a heresy trial in the church in 1927. It's a historical fact, of course, you can read about it in history books now. And they brought an ungodly QC to preside at this trial. And Professor Davy, who denied Christ, who denied his deity, who denied the great cross work, was exonerated from all apostasy and heresy, and was declared a godly man. That is the state of the Irish Presbyterian Church. And friends, it's not one whit better today. In Lima Valley, the next turn to my home, or to my town, well, it's not my time. I live in, in Gold Rail. But uh, David Armstrong, really had a very strong arm for truth. He went to Mass in the Roman Catholic Church in Lima Valley beside his own church, Christmas Eve. And on Christmas morning, brought Father Mullen into his church. And there wasn't one voice raised against it. And I met a Presbyterian minister in Korean Hospital a day or two after Christmas. I was in visiting an old lady, an old neighbor of mine, and coming out, the young minister met me. And he bid me time of day. He said, now we have Christmas over. I said, that's right, it's a good job. It's only commercialized anyway. And we went out into the grounds and he said to me, uh, what church do you belong to? Oh, I said, I'm just a uh, free Presbyterian. And he looked at me. Oh, I said, you're wily. I said, that's right. I said, tell me this, sir. You're an evangelical, a professed evangelical in Coleraine Church here, Presbyterian Church. What are you going to do about your friend up in Lima Valley? who has completely denied the doctrines of your church. Oh, I said, I, I didn't read very much about that. Did you not? I said, well, I'll tell you something about it. And I told him. And I said, I want to tell you, sir, that that is the policy of your church. And Armstrong has just done what he was told to do. Because in the General Assembly of Dublin a few years ago, they passed a resolution in the Irish Presbyterian Church that we could change pulpits with popery. And popery could send their priests to our pulpits. Or to the Presbyterian. Oh, not to the Free Church. No, excuse me. To, to the Irish Presbyterian Church. And I say, he was, Armstrong was just living up to the principle of your church. And I said, why don't you so-called evangelicals take a stand against it? You know what he said? I could hardly believe him. He said, you know, if we took a very strong stand, they would call us peers in the eyes. <laughs> I said, God help you. <coughs> I'm proud to be called a peers in the eyes. And I'm proud of that dear man that has risked his life and is still doing that for truth and righteousness in our land. Well, that was one highlight in my life, two indeed, my conversion and my being kicked out of the Irish Presbyterian Church. It was all God's plan, of course. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. There was another very great highlight in my life, and that was the day I got married. I married the dearest woman in the world. I know you'll disagree with me, you'll say that yours is that. Well, I hope you do, that's what you should think of your wife. But my little wife and I sat in school together as children. And we became sweethearts when we were just teenagers. And we went to meetings together, we knocked around for ten years, and then we got married. 
We made sure we knew each other. <laughs> and we were 41 years married. And she was a source of great comfort and strength to me. And I want to tell you, ladies, tonight, one great truth. I never saw that little lady angry in my life. I never got an angry word from her. My boy said they never saw a frown on her face. She was a gift to me from God. And God called her home just two and a half years ago. And let me mention this again. When I came home from the funeral, I stayed with my daughter. She laid up in Belfast, and I came home to my bungalow. It was like a morgue. still is. It could never be the same. And I went to bed that night, and I said, Lord, have you got anything for me under these sad circumstances? And I lifted my Bible, and I just opened up the 121st Psalm. And I read through that Psalm to the last verse again, and God says, I'll be with you when you're going out, when you're coming in from this time forth. You know, the promises of God are eternal. Forty-seven years previous, God gave me that promise when Father died. Now he renewed it to me when my dear wife passed into glory. What a God we have. Could I not plead with you sinners tonight to take this book? He'll be with you through life, through every emergency, through every change, through every sorrow, through every battle, right to heaven itself. Now, just about another two hours to go. Now, Dr. Paisley and I knew each other from the late 40s before the Walter Free Church. We had great respect and love for each other, and we used to organize Protestant rallies in the early days. And then in 1951, the 17th of March, 1951, the Free Church was formed. Now, I should have said that I started up in business on my own account sometime after I was married. I was an electrical contractor, and I opened up a shop with radio and electrical equipment and hardware and that sort of thing. And the Lord blessed me, and I was doing very well. And I remember an old aunt saying to me, John, things are going well with you. You've got your business going well. You've, and I bought a house beside my shop in Dundon. Says, you've got your house, you've got your shop, things are going well. You can just settle down now. And when she said that to me, God spoke to me and said, Can you settle down? Can a Christian settle down? Are you settled down, Christian? There's many Christians settled down. It's time you would rouse yourself. Maybe I'm speaking to some tonight. And you're now, everything's going well with you, everything in the garden's lovely, as you would say, and you're going to settle down. In God's name, don't settle down. This is not a time to settle. The devil's not settled down. Apostasy's not settled down. Popery's not settled down. It's time we would rise ourselves. And friends, that very word challenged me. free church was started and I realized immediately this was of God. And I want to tell you tonight friend that the free church is of God. I was there at the very beginning. I have seen its progress over these 33 years, 34 years and I've seen God bless it and throughout our province we have churches Witnessing to the truth of God's word. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the book of God says, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. And I believe that God raised this standard up, the standard of the free Presbyterian church. And God is using it as a tool today against the enemy. 
And my dear free Presbyterian friends tonight, in God's name, be vigilant and be strong. For the devil is going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And if he can't devour you, he'll tell you, settle down. You have a nice church and everything in the garden is lovely. Settle down. Friend, be alert. Brother, be alert. Don't give up the struggle. Don't give up the fight. Let's be in the midst of the battle today. God has raised us up for that very purpose. And I want to say this, friend, without fear of contradiction, that the Irish Presbyterian Church is the greatest enemy that Ulster has today. The Irish Presbyterian Church has taken the hand of Rome. And I know a church in Belfast. And while they were seeking to select a new cardinal for Ulster, for Ireland, Thomas O'Fee, that church sent a letter to the Pope and pleaded with the Pope to appoint O'Fee as he was a very gracious man and they could all have great fellowship with him. That's Presbyterianism. And it's on the minute book of the Irish Presbyterian Church that they can change pulpits with Rome and that Rome can dominate their pulpits. And that is true. That's their own statement. And friend, I want to tell you if you're a free Presbyterian, thank God for it. And stand where the old martyrs stood. And God will bless you. And God will multiply your numbers here. And God will deliver Ulster. I believe that. I believe God raised this church up for that very purpose. I'm supposed to be retired. I retired some seven years ago. I preached over a hundred times last year. And I think my record this year is coming up to something the same. So I, I can't settle down. Don't settle down. Well, after a while, God spoke to me. And one night I came up from the shop. Just after the church was home. My little wife had gone across the road to her parents, who were farmers. And I came in and I sat down and I was looking over my books. And God spoke to me. And he said, what about your vow? What about the vow that you made? Now, when I was saved in 32, I went to conferences and missionary meetings. And at one missionary meeting about 1934, an old missionary challenged the, boy, the <coughs> boys and girls, the young folk of the congregation, to make themselves available for God. If God should call, you'd be willing to go. And I remember bowing my head and said, Lord, I'll go, should you send me to China or Japan or India or wherever, I'll go. And I dedicated my life to God. I didn't go up to the front. I didn't show my hand, but I bowed to God. And God reminded me of that God of 1951, as I sat at home looking at my books. And I said, but Lord, things are different now. When I made that vow, I wasn't married. And it makes an awful change in a man's life when he gets married, doesn't it? Well, as I look over you men, I can see the marriage lines on your forehead. And uh, I said, I have a couple of little boys, and I have a shop, and I have contracts. I had a contract for the Ministry of Health, which would have kept me going for a year. And I had other contracts. I said, Lord, I, I just couldn't do that now. And then I said this, and I want you to listen to this young Christian tonight. I said, Lord, if you can show me from your word tonight that this is thy call, I'll sell out and go. And I opened my Bible. I just turned it over like that and it opened that Isaiah 45 and I started to read. And here's what I read in verse 2. I'll go before you. Thank God when God sends you, he goes with you. Goes before you indeed. He said, I'll go before you. And I'll make the crooked places straight and the rough places plain. And I'll cut them pieces of the gates of brass and cut them some to the bars of iron. Not thou mayest know that I have called thee by thy name. What could I say? John Wine, I have called you by your name. And I said, Lord, I'll sell our and go. God called you tonight, would you do that? 
that was going to be a very big bridge. My dear little wife came in. I'm going to tell you, no, dear, God's after calling me to go into the work of the free church. He challenged me about a vow I made way back in 34. And I said, you know, dear, it's going to be a big, a big change for you, maybe a bigger change for you than me. I said, it means selling our new house. It means selling the shop and the business. It means going into a work that is just started with a fellow that's called a rebel rouser. And I said, it's, it's not very, not very bright looking. You know what she said? She said, John, if God has called you, I'm behind you. And that wee wife of mine was behind me. Never was in the forefront. Always at home. Always there as Robbie, uh, was it Burns that said it, or some other Scottish uh, songster said, with a smile and a wee cup of tea. I think it was Harry Lauder that used to sing that. And that was true. What an inspiration she was. And so I set about selling my house. It took me a year to get out. I accepted a call down to our church in Bellamoney, which had opened. And I traveled up and down there for 15 months, every Sunday. Looked after the church until I finally was able to sell out and then move down. And then the trouble started. And I came down to Bellamoney. It was circulated that the troublemaker had come down to Bellamoney. And I used to have an open air meeting every night in the Diamond in Bellamoney town. Not many, most of you know the town of Bellamoney. And every night, every Saturday night, I herald forth the old gospel, played some hymns across the old record player. People didn't like it. Others did like it. But I kept that up for 11 years every Saturday night. Well, about 1954 or 5, I'm not sure of the date now, there was two evangelists came to my church on Sunday morning, Christian Workers Union evangelists. And after the service going out, they said, Mr. Wiley, I wonder would you let, uh, let us have your loud speaking equipment. We're having a mission in the Dunloy area, and uh, we'd like the loan of your loud speaker, and would you come up in the afternoon and give your testimony? I said, I certainly will. I didn't realize that Dunloy was about 90% or maybe more papers. When I say papers, I mean Protestant papers. And uh, I went up, of course, there was some singing, a few lassies sang solos, and then they announced that Reverend John Wiley would give us testimony. Now, there was a, a hurly much going on outside the village, and they heard my name mentioned. And I gave my testimony, told how the Lord saved me, and uh, just as I finished, I stepped back, and I looked around, and here was a 30 or 40, maybe more, fellas coming with 30 sticks on their shoulders, and they marched right down to where I was standing. And one fella came over, he says, you have five minutes to get out. Well, I said, of course, I'm not in charge of the meeting here, it's these two evangelists, I was just giving a word of testimony. And I turned to go towards my car. My little daughter was in it. And when I got near the car, they had broken every window. And they had hammered in the roof. And my little daughter, in a state of fright, opened the door, fortunately, and escaped. She could have been very well killed. When I reached the boot of the car, one of these thugs lifted his hurdy stick and cracked my head open. And I remember falling over the boot of the car, and as I was falling, another one punched me on the nose and broke my nose and I just seemed to say to the Lord, well Lord, this must be my departure. The time of my departure is at hand. And so I fell to the ground and the big fella came along and lifted me up. He was a Protestant by the way. <laughs> and he got me into the car. I had a big Armstrong Sidley in those days. And I set, got into the driving seat and they had hammered the windscreen till it was all shattered and it was just like frosted glass and I said, dear knows, how can I drive like this? I have no vision. And I hardly had the thought in my mind till a huge stone about the side of my head came right through the windscreen and lit my knee. 
Well, I said, at least I have vision now. I'll be able to see the drive. <laughs> so I managed to drive home. I don't know how I managed it. I was very badly shaken up. My nose was bleeding. My head was bleeding. And they got me to bed and sent to the doctor. And they gave me a, uh, an injection for tetanus. But after a few days, I managed to get on my feet again. And here I am, still on my feet. And uh, that was one of the battles that I had. I remember on another occasion, I was on holiday in Donahadee. And uh, I went down to the promenade one night, and there was an open-air meeting going on. And my old mother-in-law was in the car, and I turned down the window, and I said, hey, you can sit there, I'll go down and stand with me. It was the crowd. And just as I got there, the loudspeaker was switched off. And I went over to a man who was called Norman Porter, some of you possibly have heard of him. And I said, Norman, what's wrong? Oh, I said, a Roman Catholic objected to the loudspeaker. And I said, did they turn it off? He said, yeah, they've turned it off. I said, what are you going to do about it? What can you do? Well, I said, I'll do something. And, and <clears throat> so I went right over and I stood on the harbor wall. And I said, friends, this is an infringement of our Protestant liberty. And I said, I'll go back here tomorrow night with two loudspeakers. I'm going to bring Pavey down, you see. And I didn't pay you two loudspeakers. So I rang Ian up and I said, look, bring down your loudspeaking equipment. I told him what had happened. And the next night, we arrived about half seven and the place was black with people. And we set up our loudspeaking equipment. And Pavey said, you go ahead first, Wiley. You wanted me to break the... The ice, as it were. There wasn't much ice, it was a very hot atmosphere. So I preached, and as I started to preach, a policeman who was just, turn that down. I said, look, there's an old, just you turn it down if you dare. And then Peter, that gracious gentleman, came over and tapped this constable on the shoulder. He said, you know, sir, it's not very nice to interrupt a minister of the gospel while he's preaching. So he took himself off. And we had a tremendous open air. There was a farmer who lived three miles out of the town said, I heard you distinctly out there. <laughs> well, when I got home from holiday, a policeman arrived at my door with a summons. And I was summons to Donald D. Court of breaking or violating such and such a law, or by law. And I rang up in to see how he was ready. He said, I just got one this morning, too. So we were both summons to court in Donald D. And down we went. Well, the, we had the summons about three weeks before the court case. And the Monday before the court case, it was announced in the press that Mr. Bailey and Mr. Wiley were being summoned to court in Donahue by the council for breaking such and such a pilot. So we went down to court. And of course, the summons was read out of the charge. And then Mr. Bailey said to the magistrate, excuse me, sir, could I ask a question? Oh, yes, he says, certainly. Well, he says, I would like to know who summonsed us here. Because he said, Mr. Wiley and I had our summonses a fortnight ago, or three weeks ago. And he says, the council only met last Monday to summons us. Well, he says, that's a very fair question. So he brought the clerk of the council along, and he says, who summons these men? Oh, he says, it was a finance and general purpose committee who summons them, knowing that when the full council would meet, they would ratify our decision. Well, says the magistrate, you know perfectly well, sir, that you have no authority, the, the Finance and General Purpose Committee have no authority to summons anyone. And he says, I declare it null and void. And the court burst forth into song, and we got free again. <laughs> so God has been good. Then I remember in 1962, we decided we would go to Rome see the Pope. Uh, not to kiss his toe, by the way. The Presbyterian Church in Ireland, the Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, had all gone out to sit in council at the Second Vatican Council with the Pope and to discuss unity. Here they said, well, we'll go out and let them see that there's people who will not unite with Rome. And so we went out we had ordered thousands of portions of scripture and they were delivered in Rome for us and when we went out we went down to the Vatican and gave out these scriptures. 
and we were giving in to priests and nuns and friars. I don't know if I was any boilers or not, but there was friars there. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> they thought this was wonderful because they're not used to getting anything for nothing in Rome. And as we stood there in the Vatican Square and gave out these uh, testaments and scriptures, they were taking in joyfully. But then when they took them in and started to go with them, they realized what was happening. So they sent out uh, the Pope's bodyguard to arrest us. So they came out and they said, what do you do? I said, we are giving out uh, the Bible. Oh, Protestantic, Protestantic. I said, it's not Protestantic, it's the Word of God. We will comfort Gitto. I said, you will not comfort Gitto. <laughs> we looked at our Bibles. And we carried them over the white line that separated the Vatican from Rome proper, and we were right outside the jurisdiction of uh, the Vatican, and they couldn't do anything. And we stood there on Reconciliation Street, though we weren't reconciled, and we gave out all our scriptures. And then we went home to our hotel, and after dinner we went out sightseeing, and we went into a chapel, and what the hell is? This is what the Presbyterian Church wants to unite with. We went into a chapel. It's the only chapel in the world that forgives your sins by the top and the head of a fishing rod. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? And so we thought we would see this great sight. And there was a little confessional box. And uh, people would come and kneel in front of it. They didn't go inside. You see Father O'Flynn, but two sliding doors open. And there was Father O'Flynn standing, dressed like a grandmother, really. And uh, he lifted the fishing rod and he tapped them on the head. And we were smiling, and there was an American priest there watching this, and I said, hey, do you uh, believe that sort of thing? Well, you know, it's just one of these things. Oh, I said, is it? I said, the only thing I find wrong with it, sir, is that he doesn't hit them hard enough. And <laughs> so he walked away and just, of course. He must have thought I was a Protestant. <laughs> well, friends, that's over it. Oh, I could tell you other things. I, 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 I haven't time because I, I must stop preaching at half past ten. And, uh, <laughs> so I, I move on. But my, what, what, what a, a place room is. Now we stood one night, and I have a photograph of it. We stood one night uh, in the Vatican. I should have said that the next morning, before we got up, the police arrived at the hotel to ask for Mr. Wiley, Mr. Pizzi, and Mr. Doodle. <laughs> and uh, the man in the hotel came to our door and in our bedroom and said, you are wanted by police, but there is no hurry. You can wash and shave and come and have breakfast. So we went and had breakfast, and three detectives were standing there waiting on us, and they came in when we had breakfast and said, we are taking you to chief of police. You are arrested. So they took us to the chief of police, and uh, they talked to us for three hours. And then after all the talk and confab, they said, now we want you to sign this. Now we had got in touch with the consul, the British consul in Rome, to come to the headquarters of the police to help us to interpret. And uh, we said, well, we can't sign something we can't read. My uh, Spanish are is not very good, you know, for my Italian brother. And uh, he read it for us, and it simply amounted to this, that we, the undersigned, declare that we will not give out scriptures, that we will not display posters, and that we will not have any open-air meetings in Rome during our stay. And Pope Paisley stood up to his feet, he said, Sir, we will sign no Pope's bull here. <laughs> and there was an awful bit of shouting and screaming, they're very excitable people, and so are we at times. And they were shouting on both sides, and they said, Well, we want to protect you. And he said, You can go now, and uh, you will have to protect yourself. <clears throat> he didn't know the Lord was protecting us. We went back to our hotel for lunch, and just as we were leaving again, Police car drove up and three detectives came out and said, You are Paisley Wiley, do Yes. We are to be with you during your whole stay in Rome. And you are not to give out any scripture. We are here to see that you don't do that. And no matter where we went, these fellows went with us. Three of them stayed in the hotel at night. Left, we were through, Bible right through the window. <laughs> and they were with us all the time. 
during our stay in Rome. And then we got friendly with them. And we gave these three detectives a Bible each. And they said, we were told you were Banda, but you are good men. At least they realized we were good men. And so we are, you know. <coughs> it seemed to be very hard to convince. But we were. And we take these Bibles home to read to our wives and families. And I was back in Rome with Paisley, although they didn't let me in the second time. And one of those detectives came over. He said, I know you, sir. You give me biblical. I said, that's right. I have read it to my children. So God honored his word. And God blessed his word. We made also a protest in Sweden. And listen to this. This is the World Council of Churches of which the pre of which the Presbyterian, the Irish Presbyterian Church, is still a member, though they say they have withdrawn. They are still in it, being in the British country. And in Sweden, they were receiving nine Roman Catholic priests into the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches. And that's the most important committee in the World Council of Churches. They dictate a uh, doctrine. And we flew out to Sweden to make our protests. And they phoned the Swedish authorities to say they were troublemakers from Ulster going out. Keep your eye on them. And every, place, every building we went to, the police would converge on the building. And we were hindered from making any protests or giving out any leaflets until the last night. That was up in the city of Uppsala, in the university city. And there these priests were being received. So we said, well, hit or miss, jail or no jail, we'll go up to Sella, pardon me, and we'll give out our leaflets. So up we went, we parked in the campus of the university, we put on our smocks uh, with writing on it, declaring the apostasy of the World Council and the damnable heresies of Romanism, and we got our bundles of leaflets and we marched towards the, the university. And all the old apostates, I knew some of the Presbyterian ministers that were there. They were all waiting to see us arrested. <coughs> and the police came immediately over. What you do? Well, I said, they spoke to me. I don't know why, because I was the youngest member or not. But they, they spoke to me. I said, what, what are you doing? Well, I said, sir, the World Council of Churches, which is supposed to be a council of Protestant churches, is receiving nine Roman Catholic priests into their faith and order commission. And they said, we are Protestant ministers and we object to that. Now Sweden is about 95% Protestant. And this officer said, we agree with you, sir. Let us see your leaflet. And we showed them. Yes, we agree with you. And then all the world press, when they saw the priests surrounding us and talking to us, came around to see us arrested. And take our photographs. And the priest said, we want to be photographed with these gentlemen. And they were still waiting in the campus or up in the university to see us arrested. And they said, take our photographs along with these gentlemen. And then they said, now, man, just you go out and give out your leaflets and we'll be behind you. And we walked right through the whole campus and gave out our leaflets. One Protestant Presbyterian minister who knew me came over and put out his hand. He said, how are you going? I said, I never took the hand of a traitor in my life. Just put your hand back in your pocket, sir. That's Presbyterianism today, Irish Presbyterianism. They are seeking complete union with Rome. In 1966, in 1966, the Irish Presbyterian Church, now these are all historic facts, absolute facts. In their General Assembly in June, had invited De Valera's representative to sit in their council. So we decided that we would protest. We made an application to march, and we got it from the Minister of Home Affairs and from the police, a permission to march and make our protest, which we did mostly every year when the church was formed. And when we got to Comic Square, the enemy, Popery threw all sorts of missiles at us, but we marched on. And then when they got to the General Assembly, the priests decided they wouldn't allow us to march around the General Assembly, and they threw a cordon across the road. After giving us permission, and we had our written permission in our pockets. So we had an open-air meeting. They addressed the crowd, 
I said a word or two, and we marched peaceably home. And in a short time, in the month of July, we got a summons to court for conduct liable to cause a breach of the peace. It was the police that caused the trouble, not us. So we brought to court. And there was a leading police officer who went into the witness box to witness against me, and here's what he said. He said, I didn't see Mr. Wiley doing anything. I didn't hear him saying anything. I just saw his lips moving. So I got three months for moving my lips. I said, well, it's a good job I have the hoover cough. I have been for life. <laughs> three months for moving my lips. And so we did three months in jail. What a time we had. Separated from my little wife and family. Separated from my church. Because I stood for God and truth. Those were days of battle. What a time we had in jail. I was never out of the governor's office. I remember I wanted, I was a cook, by the way. <laughs> I learned to cook those uh, pastry with non fattening centers. You know, gravy rings. <laughs> keep eating the centers, you'll never get fat. <coughs> and of course, we fried Fenian steaks on the uh, crisis. <laughs> We had a rough time. Tied them up with tea and a quarter of a plain loaf with a bit of margarine on it with our breakfast. All for standing for God. And I remember when they brought me into the prison cell that night, the 22nd of July, 1966, the prison officer said, Mr. Wiley, I'll keep the light on the cell for a wee while till you get used to the place. You need to be there all your life to get used to. So, a few days afterwards, Paisley and Foster and I were sitting outside. We were in the hospital wing, and uh, the governor always came up to look around after lunch every day, and we were sitting there so we could up to pay our respect to him. And uh, I said, Governor, I have a confession to make. What do you mean, he said, Mr. Lee? You're very serious. Well, I said, you know, I was put in the reception cell the night I came in, and the prison officer left the light on, and I said, as I sat there wondering what I was going to do, I saw a moth going around the light, and I said, I committed murder. I said, I thought I was going to be three months in this prison cell with a moth, and the moth eaten before he got out, and I said, I committed murder and killed the moth. Well, he was very relieved that I didn't kill a prisoner. And, uh, he, he went away with a very stern face, and he thought I shouldn't be playing any jokes upon him. However, <laughs> these are some of the that we have. And friend, I want you, if you're a free Presbyterian, to stand more firmly for God. We started with a battle. The battle is still on. And the Presbyterian church is as vile as Rome itself. I say that without any apology. They talk about evangelicals. The emphasis is certainly on the jelly. There are no true evangelicals in the Presbyterian Church. The Free Presbyterian Church is the only Presbyterian Church that stands on the Bible. And I defy any minister to come and deny that. And I have challenged them to public debate and they wouldn't take it up. Well, friends, my life wasn't just taken up with battling all the time. God gave me a vision for us. And after I was a few years in uh, the church in Bella Money, God called me to start a work in, in, in Coal Ray. And it was a very Presbyterian town, of course. Down the north is very Presbyterian. And every door was shut. And I remember at the Protestant rally, I said, it's a strange thing that a Protestant minister can't get a place in cold rain to preach the gospel. And an orange man came over to me. He says, my boss has a place, a big garage, and it's up for sale. He was an undertaker. So I went to see the undertaker, and I was able to buy it off. A church in Hanover Place. It's now knocked down. We have a new building in cold rain. So I always say that the undertaker undertook for me, but he didn't bury me. And uh, we started our work there. And after I had it started, I got a call to go to Lima Valley. People were interested in the town of Lima Valley. 
I had a cottage meeting in a farmhouse outside Dungiven, and there was a number of people saved at it. Some of the elders of our Limmer Valley Church were saved at it. And then God gave us a bit of ground in Limmer Valley, and God enabled us to build a church there when we, before we had a congregation formed. And God supplied every penny, and we opened it free of debt without making an appeal. I got gifts from London when they heard that what I was doing. And then God called me to a work in the Maiden City, London Derry. I had a mission there with some 30 souls saved. And the last night of the mission I said, look, I didn't come here merely to have a mission. I'm glad that I had the mission. I'm glad that many has got saved. But I said, I'm here to start a, a true Presbyterian church, a faithful witness to the book and to the blood. And I said, how many will come and stand with me? And about 40 people came right up to the front and said, we'll stand with you, Mr. Wiley. And we formed a church. We bought a hall, renovated it, and started to work there. Now we have a new church in, in, in London Derby. A short time after that, an auctioneer rang me up. He says, Mr. Wiley, I have a cinema and cloth mills for sale. Would you give us a bid for it? Well, I said, what do you want? You know, I have plenty of money. He said, well, 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 what do you want for it? He said, uh, give me 1,500 pounds. I said, I'll give you a thousand. Right, he said, I'll give it to you. So we started the work in cloth mill. And I did all the electrical work, the light and heat. I'm still in the light and heat business. And I hope we give the devil plenty of heat. <laughs> and we started the work in cloth mill. A year or two after that, the same auctioneer rang up. He said, Mr. Wiley, we have a covenanting church in Darva for sale. Would you be interested? I said, I would. How much do you want for it? Oh, he said, bid me 4,000. I said, I'll bid you three. And I bid three for it. And then the committee, there was only a few in the covenanting church. They didn't like Wiley to get it. And they decided that they would sell it then in two lots. A building, and then they would take all the pews and the pulpit and sell it separately. And he rang me up and says, what's your offer? I said, 3,000, same amount, for an empty church. And I got it. And so I work in Dharma, where our brother served for a number of years. It's going on well. I was preaching there the other day. <laughs> and so God did really help us. And God blessed. And God uh, poured out his blessing upon us. And then... I went to Lurgan. I accepted a call to Lurgan. And the year after I went to Lurgan, I had a heart attack. I think due to all my labors, battles, and fights. But the Lord uh, put his hand upon me and restored me. And then my dear little wife and I were on holiday in Fort Rush in 75. We were still in our Lurgan church. And the second night I was there, I had a very heavy heart attack. And they had to take me to the hospital and put me onto the cardiac unit. And I lay in hospital for nearly a month in cold rain. That was in 75. It was 10 years ago. And when I came home, I was very weak. And I want you to listen to this. Because God can do wonderful things. God is a miracle working God. And my doctor said to me, you know, Mr. Wiley, your heart's in a bad condition. And he said, I want you to go for little walks to stimulate your heart. And I remember walking up and down the Banbridge Road, feeling very distressed. And one day I said to the Lord, Lord, is it always going to be like this? Am I going to be an old crock? I've been before better going home to glory. And God said, from the 27th Psalm, the last verse, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. I said, Lord, that's enough. I just rest on that promise. And I was back preaching in three months. And I've been preaching ever since. Now, because of my wife's illness, she had a couple of strokes. Very weak on it. Though she had all her mental abilities, I felt it was time to retire from being a pastor at least. And so I retired some seven years ago. And yet I kept on preaching and engaged nearly every Sunday. And then one night, my wife and I had supper together. 
then she went up towards the bedroom. I went up some time afterwards and she was holding on to the dressing table and the bed. And I said, what's wrong dear? She said, I'm not too well, John. Help me onto the bed. She had a very heavy coronary and she died on her way to hospital. Well, friend, that was a very big blow to me. She was my partner for 41 years. My sweetheart for nearly 60. And we were children. That was a big break. But I want to tell you that she's in heaven tonight. Mm -hmm. And that one day, through the boundless grace of God, we meet in that land that is fairer than day. And through his word and spirit, he has maintained me and supported me and kept me. I don't know how long I have to stay here, but while I am here, I am that long until the journey is over. And I would plead with you, dear friends, to <coughs> God's name, to take a bolder stand for God. The enemy is vigilant. The enemy is busy. The enemy is working day and night to destroy this land of ours. And I believe that our free church is the only bastion against poverty. So let us be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand in this evil day and having done all to stand. May God bless you.